Okay, well, uh, preventing disputes is clearly <clears throat> um, a lot cheaper than solving disputes, so that's why we've tried to spend a little bit of time talking about that. But let's imagine a dispute arises. What's the first thing you should do? You know, you, 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 let's put this in the context of a real estate uh, development program. Uh, you are the investor. You have contracted with a developer here in Marbella to build a project of 50 houses. When it goes wrong, when you start having an argument with him, what's the first thing you should be doing? First step uh, will be to contact to the other part. Okay, yeah. to contact to the other part in order to know more about the dispute. Yes. Okay? About uh, to know more about what a uh, different interpretation of what you thought okay is uh, happening. Yes. Okay? In that first contact with the other part, I advise that if it is possible to have a face-to-face -face yes. meeting. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have realized that in many cases the problem is because of misunderstanding between both parties, but because maybe they had a phone conversation, something was said by an email, a call email, okay, and uh, that is mm, the reason of the problem. It is that I advise to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the other part in order to know uh, uh, in order to know more about the dispute. And also, it's probably worth pointing out that. There are very big differences in business culture between, say, Spain and, say, Japan, or Spain and, say, the United States. And, and by that, I don't mean in any way that Spain is backward when it comes to business culture. That's just not true. But every country has different ways of doing things yep. and has different ways of explaining things. Yep. And sometimes uh, when you listen to uh, a person arguing in Spain, it can seem very intense and much more heavy yeah. than they really than they really mean. Yeah. So if you're going to have a conversation with your business colleagues, you do need to understand a bit about their business culture. Yeah, that is because it is advisable to, if you are not familiar with the culture of the country, that you have the help of a lawyer and a local lawyer, yes. okay, in order to deal with that because in some cases we realize that the problem is not a legal problem it's a problem of the culture yes. or, or the language yes. in some in some cases okay it is or just different personalities dif different people having different ways of doing things yeah yeah that is because that face to face meeting if you don't understand the language somebody who is helping you with the language and the culture it is a professional a lawyer a local lawyer to help you with that do you think it's a good idea when the two people have their face meeting, face to face meeting, that the lawyer should be there at the first meeting, or are you better letting them try and sort it out between themselves, and then maybe having a second lawyer, a second meeting where the where the lawyers are present? In Spain, because the Spanish culture, okay, I advise that the first meeting is going to happen between the clients. Yes, okay? I agree. Both parties, yes. okay, because when a lawyer is in a meeting, Change, a part, changes everything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The other part can uh, understand that that is the uh, starting of the war. Okay? Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, that is not the exactly. intention of having in that meeting. Yes. Yeah. So the first meeting, you're, you're going to it with the intention of finding a solution to this problem. And of course, finding a solution usually means some sort of compromise. Uh, it is unrealistic to expect that you are 100% in the right and they are 100% in the wrong. That is. Um, and I, I find these first meetings are very often helped if, if there's a couple of beers involved. It, yeah. uh, people, people get more, more fluid. Okay, so you contact the first party, you have a meeting, you try to sort it out, but let's say at the end of that meeting it's clear that either the other person cannot or will not honour the obligations under the contract. What do you do next? Next thing that, uh, we, will, that we will do is to try to get away to get a solution yes. to the problem, okay? So, the, so next you go to your lawyer and your lawyer then helps you try to find a solution? Yeah, it is good to go to your lawyer because your lawyer is going to uh, understand your position, can give you advice about what is your position, because if there is no solution between the parties, it is necessary to start a negotiation or it is necessary to go to the court, okay? And um, first thing before doing that is to know what is your position and the legal consequence that you have if you don't get a solution. Yes. Depending on that, 
you are going to be in a stronger position to go to the court or not. And, and of course, if you're thinking of going to court, you want to know that the people you're going to take to court have got some money. Yeah. There's no point in going to court and having a fantastic victory yeah. if the person goes bankrupt. Yeah. So all of these things are things that your lawyer would deal with and advise you about. That is. That is because uh, we must study the case, we must uh, analyze if you have a case and we can uh, start a negotiation with the other part knowing if we are in a strong position to negotiate yes. or not. Now what information do you need the client to bring to you when you have that meeting with them? Yeah. It is necessary, uh, I can advise to do it in all cases, that the client is preparing a writing, a writing uh, list with all the facts, okay? And uh, doing in writing where he thinks that the problem arises. Because doing that in writing, it helps you to organize your ideas. Yes. You review your ideas, you review the contract, you review the documents that you have, and it's good that we have that first meeting with a writing that has been done by the client explaining everything. Before the meeting. Before so, the meeting. So the client sends you a, a, an email, a long email, saying well, this is the problem. Yeah. And they also send you copies of all of the relevant documents. So yeah. that when you meet the client, you've had time to read those and you can have a sensible discussion rather than learning about all of this for the first time. That is, that is what we advise to do in all cases when a problem arises. Yeah. And the other thing the client will need to bring you, because this is now required for your professional purposes and money laundering and everything, is proof of who they are and proof of their authority if they're coming on behalf of the company, proof that they have the authority to negotiate on behalf of the company. It is in order to accept a, a, a client, it is that we need the identification of the client, a yes. copy of the passport, one client form with all the details of the of the client, and giving us the authorization to use that detail for that case. Okay, it is the contact uh, telephone number, email, the address, any proof of the of the address, and. Of course, if the, the person is acting on behalf of the company, before doing anything, we must have the confirmation that that person has yes. the power to, to do it. So at, at the outset, passport, copies of a couple of utility bills to prove the address where the client lives, All right. and if they're coming from a company, a letter from the company saying we confirm that this person is authorised to deal on our behalf. All right. And then later you'll need powers of attorney and various other yeah. things, but that's a good enough to start with. It can happen that one person is acting in behalf of another person, of yes. the wife or the son, exactly. or then, then it Same will be necessarily a power of attorney, specific yes. power of attorney. In that but, case. but to begin with, a letter from that other person saying, yes. uh, I'm authorizing my, my aunt to yes. come and see you because she lives in Marbella and I live in New Zealand. That is. Yes. And I guess the other thing you need to know, but maybe this comes a little bit later is just how far the client is prepared to go. In other words, how far are they prepared to go to compromise? Um, I, that will often depend upon the advice they receive, but it's always, I think, a good idea, isn't it, to just get an idea as to whether they're prepared to move at all, yeah. or whether they are prepared to you know, meet the other person halfway, or, or whatever the position might be. Yeah, we must know that, but uh we advise that to take that decision um, before know where you want to go is necessary to know where you are. Exactly. So that comes later. That, that yes. Is, it will yes. come later because uh, uh, in some cases we have a meeting with a client and the problem is maybe 200 euros. Okay? Yes. And they want to go to the high court yeah, exactly. to this discuss is not about a good that, idea. but it's not a good idea. Yes. It's not, it is necessary to explain that yes. we must uh, get another way, we must go through another way to get a solution before going to the high court of Spain. I, I, and I think, I mean, this is really important, I think, in every country, that sometimes you have to say to the client, look, you may be perfectly legally right here, but the cost of enforcing your rights will be many times the amount of compensation you're going to get back. That happened. And, and frankly, you're better just forgetting about it and moving on with your life. 
Mm, it happens, and in that cases, we will advise to avoid a court yes. case because it's going to be more expensive yes. than the case that you have. And it's not just cost; it's emotional investment. Yes. If you if you start a court case, you could be talking five years of having to it put in happen. time and worry and so on. So, what, we have to be realistic about what can be achieved. Yeah.